All right, thank you. And I think next we have a report from David Hicks on alternatives to incarceration. I'm on it. So I shouldn't do a lot of stretching. Please feel free. Uh, to be yourself. I'm trying to improve. We used to have one of them bike car co-ops in Jersey. So we would just borrow one and drop it off someplace later when we didn't need it. Anymore. I don't know if that's what you're talking about here. But we used to have some of this life. <laughs> That's not what you're talking about. You already have that. No, 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 I really have one. I don't know. That was not a government approved program. That's a good defense for my next client. That's already in place. I thought it was a co-op. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It a whole lot of reporting to get it happen. It's all good. <laughs> so zero funding is a solution. Get it started soon. Yeah. <laughs> Try to have um, okay. I've yeah. hit something I'm not supposed to hit. I don't know what I'm doing. Go up to slideshow. Yeah. What I do? Go up to slideshow. Slideshow. Oh, oh I got it. Right. Thank you. You sure. Okay. Um, and then every time I click this, I do something. It's right there, Marty. <laughs> Uh, I'm computing challenge. All right, um, Madam Chair, thank you all. I'm trying not to take up too much of your time. Uh, my name is David Hicks. Um, hat I'm wearing for these purposes is I'm interim director for the Department of Justice Services. The uh, presentation today uh, was significantly contributed to by Rhonda Gilmore, Dr. Gilmore. She's here today. She's uh, head of our Adult Service Program Manager. She's the program manager for adult services. Tom Fitzpatrick. Tom is here also. He's recently on board uh, as a criminal justice planner. Uh, Teresa Searles, she's our evaluation specialist. She's not here today. In addition, with us here today is Rufus Fleming. Rufus is uh, a deputy director over at the department. Um, he's been on board since uh, May. Um, background, Jenny, uh, I think I handed out Everybody, the, the topic of the briefly, great. Briefly, 2009, Community Criminal Justice Board charged by the mayor to address the issue of jail overcrowding. Obviously, that was made in conjunction with the decision to uh, go forward with the construction of the new jail or justice center, as we would like to call it. Um, and clearly, as you all know, the decision was made by the mayor back in 2009 not to build a jail the size of which a recommendation at that time had suggested, which I believe was about 2,000 person facility. Um, uh, basically also we were saying we would recommendation to create for the Criminal Justice Board alternatives to incarceration that are cost effective, community based, and able to deliver quality programs for individuals who receive services through these alternatives. Kind of, I want to jump ahead a little bit and come back on what we're trying to achieve. And I guess also for historical purposes, that was 09. We went forward candidly, because again, especially for Ms. Trammell, and because I've been in front of her committee a lot for the detention center, I'm not really big on trying to not show the good, the bad, and the other. So I believe in saying what it is and then it now to remember what I said. Um, there, when I took over the department after the closure of the detention center in April, soon thereafter the mayor also charged me with this task for the alternative <coughs> program. Prior to that, the task had been housed with Dr. Graham and then Director Keita. Uh, now as far as the 
criminal the Division of, Juvenile, of Justice Services. Right now, as we are here today, Dr. Gilmore is, Dr. Gilmore is the only management level person that's now at that agency that was there when I got there. So we've had a complete reworking of the agency. So we can jump to the end and I can tell you, right now we are on this particular issue, we are probably about a year behind where we should be. And you know, so I can jump to the end and tell you, you know, we should have been where we are now. If we were here this time last year, it would have been cause for concern. The fact that we're here now with the jail opening in January 14 is bright in the windshield because there is a lot to do and there are some things that should have been done, one would have thought would have been done, that haven't been done. So I'm not here to throw anybody under the bus, but I'm also here to tell you that if you have all the why hasn't it been done questions, I don't have the answers. And in the last couple of months, I could either spend it trying to figure out what had happened that didn't happen, or I could try to make the goal of being ready when we open up, and that's where I decided to put my energies. Um, so I'll say that in advance. We're behind. I'm the first one to tell you we're behind. And uh, we've got a steep road to climb. I do believe we'll be able to get there. I think we've got great people on board, but it's going to be uh, it's going to be tight. Anyway, jumping ahead, <clears throat> the biennial plan uh, came out. The criminal justice biennial plan that outlined strategies, etc. At the end of the day, the plan indicated that careful attention must be given to identifying the jail detainees to be safely and effectively supervised in the community or non-jail setting. Uh, bottom five categories represent the populations targeted, low-risk offenders, substance abusers, traffic offenders, technical violations or probation offenders with underlying mental issues. None of that's anything new. All of that is things that everybody in the criminal justice system has been saying for the last 20 years. So nobody's identified a thing yet, new, the difference is what's the half. How we're going to get there, a question we don't have answered yet, and we're desperately trying to figure out, it's not just the how, but it's the where the money's going to come and pay for it. Because that's one of the reasons why the current system, in my opinion, is in place. Because, unfortunately, too often, the cheapest thing to do was to continue just to put them in warehouses in jail, as opposed to find something that's long-term beneficial for the community. So part of what we are attempting to do is do a paradigm shift. And by that, I brought this in, just to show you how deep it is. This Sunday, just found this yesterday. All right, this Sunday, front page article in the newspaper talking about the issue, fairly safety issue of testing and driving, and it's going to be gone to the General Assembly. It's an important issue. The headline, however, is illustrative. Text and drive, go to jail. So it's not be punished, it's not be held accountable, it's go to jail. One of the things that we have gotten caught up in throughout the system is a jail is the default position that we assume should be the first step, and it should. That paradigm shift is going to have to occur if we are going to do this properly. One thing that I will say, and one of the things I think I found, or how we got here and got so late. I really do believe that there are individuals who thought that we were looking for a tweak solution. We are not. Let me be very clear. One of the things that you all dealt with last year, you know, no hiding the ball. When all of the issues came up about uh, what the, I think Mr. Jewell particularly remembers this, what the uh, rated capacity, et cetera, and all those questions, and it became very clear that titles meant something special. Sometimes it did not necessarily mean what one would have thought was commonly thought. For example, a 1032 rated capacity, we learned in council, and sometimes even in administration, did not mean there, there were 1,032 beds. That meant the rated capacity. That had to do with formulas that came from the state, and specifically for 1,000 rated two beds, it meant that you had 10% more special use beds than that. So by definition, a rated capacity of 1032 means you actually have 1,100 or so beds. 
say all that to say, I want to make sure when we're having these conversations, our objective is clear. It's not to play with the numbers. It is to take a system that for the last 20 plus years has had an excess on average of 13 or 1400 individuals on a given day behind those bars and get that number down to something around the 1200, 1100 neighborhood. It's not something that's being done to play with numbers. And I say that up front because believe me, there are a lot of ways to play with the numbers, even as far as we could put extra bunks in every cell and have 1,400 bunks in the cell and still have a rate of capacity of 1032 and still have that number of people in there and be able to say the jail's not overcrowded because everyone has a bunk. That is not what we're trying to do. Since that's not what we're trying to do, there are no easy answers. Frankly, as I said before, if something if there are no easy answers, we should be further down the road than we are. All right. Estimated population reductions from the CCJB report indicated this: 50 to 100 offenders with mental illness. One of the things we have done with the help of Mr. Heron is instituted the, the mental health doc. Not getting too deep into the weeds. We ran into some concerns when it comes from the General Assembly on whether or not they want you to actually be able to call things courts or dockets and push back from that. That might be a battle we have to fight over the General Assembly. It's one of the challenges in trying to change the system. This stuff is very involved. 150 offenders with substance abuse. In my opinion, I think that's going to be our greatest challenge with the potential greatest rewards. If we finally start addressing where these individuals with substance abuse need to be. Do they actually, for the purposes of public safety, for the purposes of the operation of the criminal justice system, do they actually need to be in a full security jail, or is there something else to accommodate that? That is where the hard question is going to be, and that's where the hard answer is going to be. And some of them we can get from other places, some of them we might have to actually figure out and just make sure we make them work here. Um, 100, and, 100 to 150 low risk offenders, 50 traffic offenders, 50 technical violators, that's what was identified as the potential places where we could do population reduction. Again, this is the paradigm shift. And in the end of the way road, if we do not change how we think and how we operate, we're just buying time to end up here again in my humble opinion. The use of the jail should be the last option, not the default option. We have been operating for the last 30 years with the use of the jails to default option. If you don't know where to put somebody, if they're homeless, if they've got mental health issues, if they can't make bond, put them in a jail. That's got to change. And it's not going to happen easily, and it's going to take a bold move to make it happen. And we cannot say it over again because there's a lot of ways to sugarcoat it. There's only about two or three ways to do it right. Our mission has to be to create a system that promotes public safety and the effective operation of the criminal justice system by providing the appropriate level of intervention and response to the assessed risk. we got to do this smart. And if we don't do it smart, we're going to do it another way. Do we have all the answers? No. But do we think we can get there? Yeah, we do. Um, jumping ahead, evidence-based correction protocol, determinants for managing jail population, you have to deal with admissions, length of stage, risk assessments, classifications, transitions. One of the things I found out, and I'm glad I had the background or wasn't totally new, is when you get to definitions and some of the protocols that people have there for a reason, that's where the hard work is in. You know, one of the things, you know, we've been really good with the sheriff being willing to work with us, but at the same time having to understand, <coughs> you know, we're asking a lot of him when you talk about changing classifications. Sometimes you can have a classification system that literally determines how you can be classified, risk assessment, one being, I think, the most dangerous, eight being the least, that if you had an offense from 10 years ago, that still factors into your risk assessment. So asking him to reevaluate his classification system for the default position not to be, I lock them up, I'm covered, it's not my fault. But that's a big ask. To ask the Commonwealth Attorney to have something that he can believe in so the default position for his prosecutors is not no bond judge. All of those things have to have buy-in. It's not just criminal justice. 
services, how it determines the magistrates, the police department, it's the sheriff, it's a system-wide reevaluation. And luckily, we've got good partners. I mean, I cannot say enough about Mike Herring's willingness to work with us on this, because candidly, without his and Woody's willingness to work with us on this, this thing would be dead in the world. Um, Evidence-based decision-making. I'll be the first to tell you, I bristle sometimes with the evidence-based term. That seems like the newest thing that's going on nowadays. I think criminal justice evidence-based, you know, as if it would be anything else. Um, best result to achieve when the criminogenic, Dr. Gilmore teases me about that word, it's not even what it meant before I heard it, so, needs a target intervention and treatment. You know, misconduct has to be uh, diminished with swift and certain proportionate response incentives, positive reinforcement, all that comes from it. Please, on all these slides, notice the source line. Um, that's the National Association of Pre-Child Services Agencies, Pre Services uh, where that came from. Uh, programming provided in a community setting is designed to produce better results. Sanctions alone without programming do not contribute to recidivism reduction. One of the things you'll see as we go through here, if one of the numbers, some of the numbers are skewed, we do have frequent flyers in the criminal justice system that tend to run the numbers up, you know, and probably addressing those are probably long-term our best place to really get systematic change. Some of it is real, some of it is just counting. One of the things we found out anecdotally as we get down to think, an admission, for example, can happen every time a person comes in to the facility. It also can happen if the person is temporarily transferred to another jurisdiction because of charges they have there. We can have somebody in Richmond who gets transferred down to Newport News to deal with his charges there. When he comes back, we count him again. You know, the person has never got out of handcuffs, but we count him twice. You know, so some of the numbers are real, but some of the numbers are also don't have an initial reaction to the numbers until you know what goes behind the numbers. So just a caution. Yes, sir. And ask that question too. How come they can't finish their term right here and, instead of getting transferred? Because I have a friend right now that's right. what's happened to her, her yes. daughter. I don't have an easy answer. Sometimes, you know, people got to settle their accounts to other places. Sometimes judges can give you credit for things served on time. Sometimes they choose not to. It's involved, and I don't have all the audience the now. So. Because now, after she finishes her term there or mm -hmm. her time, she's got to come back here. And finish it. Right. And she didn't understand how she just couldn't do it all one time right here, then go there and do it. Reba, sometimes, so, sometimes judges in different jurisdictions feel like because there are two different events that happen at different times, mm -hmm. the person shouldn't have to only serve one time for both crimes. They feel like they ought to serve the crime, the time for the crime committed there. So, you get five days here and you get five days there, instead of serving one five day period, the judges feel like you ought to serve my five days and you can go deal with that judge in his five days. It's, it's, yeah, there's no, in no two cases are all usually like you. Sometimes, and there are some times a judge say, okay, you're already in jail here, I'll give you time, credit for that time served, but it's the judge's decision. Man. I don't know if I can make it. Maureen, you had something? Yes, uh, which has been my mantra from day one. You mentioned every category uh, up and down the food chain except the judges. And to this moment, I don't know where we are with how acquiescent the judges are. I heard about the Commonwealth Attorney and the Sheriff, uh, the magistrates and all the rest, but the judges are a whole different ballgame. And until we get acquiescence from them, I don't see how any of this is going to work. And I would but, what I think the process on how it's going to have to work is I don't think we should or could expect the judges to buy in unless until we're convinced what it is that we've built will work. I mean, they're not going to buy into just the concept, but I do believe if you design and build something that the Commonwealth Attorney, the Sheriff, and all the stakeholders up and down the line say, we like this and we trust and believe in it, I think the likelihood that the judges will give it a try is about as high as you can possibly make. 
And let me, CCJ but, was, yeah, I think Marty, let me just say I that I, I'm right just now. convinced that, that uh, this is revolutionary, what we're exploring here. And, and my hat's off to the effort and to you for believing. Uh, so I'm 100 percent with you. I just don't know whether this plan is going to work until we get buy-in from these judges. And you got hanging judges out here. <laughs> they, they ain't interested in any kind of mediation and mitigation. Uh, go to jail. And and so uh, that's a tough one. But I hear you. You got to build it first and then present it and sell it. Uh, and that's probably how it's going to have to go. And don't forget, CCJB has a general district, a juvenile district, the juvenile domestic relations district court, and a circuit court judge on CCJB along with Dr. Newville and some other folks. So they are part of the process. And no, every one of them may buy in completely. That doesn't mean a rat's patootie when it comes to the others. I mean, you, you down there, you know how independent those guys are. Huh? Well, yeah. How they lord over their church. Yeah, yes, yeah. That's right. um, so he he gets gets the some of this is. I think Chris had a comment. Here. Uh, I heard earlier, uh, it's about I think page two or so, how we're going to have to get some buy-in from the General Assembly. Might. 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 Depends on some of the So that will not be a. Uh, that's not something that should be in our legislative package this year. No, sir, I wouldn't. I think in a perfect world, it would be nice to know by now, but at this stage, I don't think we could be in a place where we can recommend something um, to the tour for legislative package. And this is just, when you say help from the <coughs> assembly, you're not just speaking of dollars, you're speaking of state code and so forth where we can actually do what we're planning to do. I don't do think we have the authority to do right. everything we want to do right now? I don't know. Okay. And I would say, and that's why through there is an anecdote, one of the things going on with the General Assembly, and interesting enough, Mr. Joel, for the judge's point of view, it's being viewed as the General Assembly trying to restrict their discretion. When there's discussions over the ability to have some the I just messed up the ability to have some of the special uh, court dockets, etc. You know, so the mental health docket. You know, that's there's a tension there. I don't know where it's going to end up, but um, it is something I brought it up because I wanted to be us to be aware of it. It's one of those those factors out there that I would rather us not be aware that it exists. Right now, do I view this imminent problem? I do not. But you know, it's on the horizon, and we're going to have to be aware of it as we move forward. Okay. Just if we could have a breakout of what we definitely have the authority to do now, I think that would be helpful, so that uh, we can get a better estimation of what we're definitely going to be able to do on the front end, mm -hmm. and then uh, what we're going to have to work on for the 2014. General Assembly. Not a problem. Um, these are sort of the the processes you go through incarceration or these are sort of some of the key decision point places. You know, arrest, interestingly enough, you have to include and one of the successful places for that has been with the mental health and the intervention. You know, to make sure that the police officers have the proper training and they know who they're supposed to call when they encounter an individual that has some mental health challenges as opposed to the regular paradigm of let me take them down to the jail and others figure out. That has been very, very fruitful so far. That's very promising. So that's also very promising when we talk about can we do a general paradigm shift. I think that's probably the best example of yes, we can. You know, because officers are extremely amenable to having more tools to work with and can like to having people involved that they have the trust on. You know, what's the appropriate tool for the job. Um, Pre-trial status, charging decisions, plea determination, sentencing, community intervention, violation response. Violation response, for example, what's that? If a person has uh, probation or if they've been released and they have conditions of their release and they violate one, what happens? 
you know, some of that, in the end of the day, if I go down all these things, arrest, that's mostly going to be police law enforcement. Pre-trial status, charging, plea determination, sentencing, combination with the Commonwealth attorney and the judges. Community intervention, that's programmatic. Violation response, that's judges, Commonwealth attorney. Discharge from district system, local institution, institutional needs, different stakeholders. Um, now I want to get down to this. I just have to get a little free there. Richmond City Jail's admission for the fiscal year of 08 through 11. And I want to start with the definition. <coughs> and a jail mission is defined by a criminal justice final report as individuals committed to the city jail by a judge <coughs> or magistrate. These notes, the total numbers may include multiple omissions of an individual. So look at the numbers, but please, 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 I've been doing it for 26 years. Not look at those numbers and run with them and think they tell you the whole story. They do not. Because technically under that, I could have a misdemeanor charge that I got arrested and locked up for, and it's going to count. I could have had a felony charge that I got released by the magistrate on bond and not put in jail, and it won't count. Please do not take this as an indication of, ooh, this is the how many people are arrested or what's the state of crime. It's not. You know, so. But it is the number of people that actually enter into the jail. No. It's a factor of the number of people who actually enter into jail. You could have the same person that gets counted multiple times. So that's what I'm saying. Don't take the numbers and run with them. Just look at them for assuming that I'm counting the same thing, whatever the thing is, over a course of time. But it's just a step one. It does not give you enough information to make any, any policy determination on. For example, this will tell you that in the course of five years, we have gone from 26,000 admissions to 18. Is that a reflection of just crime dropping? Don't take it to mean anything other than jail admission. I mean, and not to me, like, it's what number is captured, but please don't take it and say, oh, but it must mean something else. Yes, I'm sorry. So, that, so would that mean that, that that is a good trend? It's a trend, and it's, it's better than going the other way. So if you're saying, what's the most I can get out of it? Well, that? It's better than going the other way. You know, it's like, okay, it looks like we're heading in the right direction. Okay. It looks as though, overall speaking, we have less of a use of the jail than we had before. And once you get beyond that general, it looks, the severity of the people in there, mm -hmm. nothing. I don't know any of that from these numbers. So don't make it anything more than this. Cynthia, so, is it possible to break out When I talked about what should have been done by now, that's number one on the list. The data mining so we can actually know what this means. We are in the process of doing that now. So it would have been nice if this had been done already because as we're designing the programs, that's what you need to know. If these are, if these are child support non-payers, if these are uh, drug offenders, if, if the, what they are, you know, if I've got 26,000 drive-by shooters, there's not a whole bunch I'm going to be able to do. If i got 26,000 back child support payments, I've probably got a bunch of room to get the place, you know, population down. We're going on anecdote. The good news is it's decently well-informed anecdote. The people that we have involved, Woody, other people involved in the system, well, they've got a good sense but you kind of need a little bit better data and you said to do programs. Yeah, that's in progress now. We've been on that pretty hard for about six weeks, eight weeks. Yeah. So six, eight weeks into the process. So that's the, the, the bad news. And a follow-up to that question now. Based on the data that we do have, mm -hmm. it is in a format or program way that we can better define. I no. Mean, I mean, do we need new programs so frequently when we do this 
Well, so the data that we have, even though it's good data, it's not data that we can sort or analyze in a way that gives us the kind of information that we need. And I guess that's the question I'm asking. Are we able to get the kind of information that we're looking for from the current data that it is? We are. There's going to have to be. It's not as one of our challenges, and you're not getting too deep into the week, one of our challenges in mining the data has been some of how it's been recorded. I mean, it's not been recorded for the purposes of some of the information we're trying to get out of it. It's been for something else. So it can be found, but a lot of times you literally have to go in there and manually go back through. You have to necessarily, a person might, Thomas used an example earlier, they maintain which number of times for the last mission? I mean, to answer the question, the way the database is done is used to manage their population. It's not used to do an analysis after the fact. So I analogize this to going to King's Dominion, and I can tell you what time the person came to King's Dominion and what line they're waiting in currently, for what ride. But I can't tell you how long they rode in the rides earlier. So I can't tell you how long an individual who's currently in jail was pre-trial, how long he was in um, post I mean, after his conviction but before sentencing or after his sentencing to be in different status because every time his status changes or her status changes it's rewritten into that code so we are now working on going backwards and trying to figure out how we can do that analysis so that we can break it down and provide that to you but that's some, that is the challenge um, is that it's a population management system it's not a system that was designed to do an analytical work and part of that, candidly, is it's doing what it was designed to do. It has never been a mission of, okay, as we go along, one of these days we're going to try to figure out whether everybody who's here needs to be here or they could be somewhere else. It wasn't a mission statement. You know, so you gather the data for your mission. Your mission is to keep the people here, there, and not be able to harm the public and hopefully not each other. That was the mission of the jail. That's the data they kept. Nobody's job was, let's figure out how we can have fewer people up in here. They didn't keep that data. Now, we think it can be derived, you know, because it needs to be. It probably should have been 10, 10 years ago. But, you know, that's where we are here now. And the good news is we've got an urgency of a new facility coming online in, in 13 months. So well, we've got to figure that. Yeah, um, uh, for, for safety convenience, uh, could, could much of what we're talking about, not all, but much of what we're talking about uh, be encapsulated under pretrial services, not totally. court services. Yeah. Uh, what, what are we talking about here? That's an Can we put a name on what, it, what would be the umbrella for all of this activity? I think the umbrella for all this activity is, and, and I'm hesitant to say, you know, really almost goes back to our, the paradigm shift. The umbrella of the activity is for us to figure out, you know, what's the number of individuals that can be maintained in the criminal justice system outside of a jail facility without compromising public safety or the operation of courts. I think if we define it like that, we'll get to the answer that's best we can do. If we define it some other way, we can get to an answer short of it. I think that which should be our should So I'm ahead of myself and trying to Not make ahead. it neat and clean. And no, well, and that's one of the things because, in the, and this is I will challenge everyone for. This is this is pushing a little bit. The objective is not neat and clean because the reality is someone could argue that neat and clean is what we have already. That you know, if you want to make sure that the person is going to show up for court, I can tell you what: if you give them to the jail, they're going to show up in court. Now, what are the other costs associated with whether they needed to be there? That's somebody else's problem. And since we don't count, since we don't count that, I don't know how much that costs. But I can tell you, on court day at nine o'clock, the judge doesn't have to worry about whether you're there or not if he didn't give you to what. That's how we got the problem. One of the things I'll say it now, I'll say it again, I'll say it again, especially for the short term. For the short term, the pure dollars and cents of someone being someplace other than the city of jail may not be immediately less. Because the reality of the situation is the marginal cost of adding another person to the jail 
eating a whole bunch. Okay, it's not a whole bunch more food, it's no more money for the deputies. Once you've got that fixed cost of a facility, that's one of the other slippery slopes that gets you to a facility where the default position is put them in jail. The other reality, which we have to own, is who our population is, especially in a poor city like Richmond. These are disproportionately poor people, which means disproportionately the advocacy for why are we doing it this way doesn't normally naturally exist. It's really easy to get how we got here. There is no bad guy. This is the way the slope of the road is, and the ball is going to roll that way all by itself. So one of the things is stop looking for the bad guy, because he or she doesn't exist. It just ends up people doing their job the way they learned it, and you look up and you've got what you've got. Well, we could argue that. Oh, uh, I mean, there's instances. I mean, I'm, I'm not being the last one to say there are instances. But for the most part, it is what it is. Now, I'm sorry, jump in. Um, and I want to take releases. Okay, this sort of corresponds to admissions. Releases defined as individuals with an equal commitment, sentence served, transfers without the city jurisdiction, and those who are posted by. Uh, average daily population, and that was kind of getting to it. Again, I hate to be, please don't just think this is what it is. Averages can be many things. <coughs> it looks as though the jail takes their count at the end of every month and then uses that to calculate the average. It's close enough. Somebody might say what you really should do is take the count every day and then divide, you know. But in the end of the day, for program purposes, if you're off by 10 or 20 people and you've got a facility that you're trying to reduce the population of a couple hundred, you know, it's, it's within the margins. But don't take this as gospel. That's kind of what I'm there. All right. Then this is a different way in this chart. I'm sorry. You said the average was the beginning of the month and the end of the month? No, the average is, right now, my understanding is that at the end of each month, the last day of each month, right. they take a count. Right. And then. You must have a count every day. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. The. The chart I'm just wanting to know how you compute the average. Yeah, the chart is actually is the average. It's the average of the month, but it's not computed. It's just it is an average of each day. Okay. How, sorry. But <laughs> some, some, so, sorry. So the other statistics later on and how we divided up the general population okay. was taking snapshots um, of looking what who's there on that day, and that was the. Okay. So average. This don't get this there. run too far. Okay, sorry, that's my not explaining well. Um, again, average population. The good news. Is Trending purposes, for just purposes of trending, over the past five years, the trend is going that. <coughs> we seem to be going in the right direction. Obviously, we've had a pretty leveling off for the past three years. We had a significant drop, you know, from 08 to 09, and it seems like we're leveled off. Good rule of thumb for purposes of what are our goals. We are running an average population in excess of 1,300, and our goal is to get it below 20. So for purposes of programming, the difference in 10 and 20 is not going to make all that much of a difference. You know, that's, we've got a wage to go. And it has to be sustainable. And again, I'm going to tell you, and I'll tell you again, there's a whole bunch of tricks on any given day. You can move that number. The question is whether or not you're going to be sustainable. Yeah. Thank you. But we're not going to send a message that we're getting too soft on Absolutely not. Because that's what a lot of people are asking. And I told them no, that you have mentioned that before, that it's not going to be that. It's just going to be moving different people. We're not letting different people that have mental issues or whatever, or drug offenses or DUIs, or <coughs> not paying child support. They're the ones that will be put somewhere else. But as far as you, we're not going to send out a message saying that, you know, if you do this, you're not going to be arrested. Here you are. This is not about lack of accountability. Mm -hmm. This is not about sacrificing public safety. What this is is about, and let's find the most appropriate placement for the individuals in order to achieve the goal of public safety and accountability. So that, that's what we're trying to do. And, and that's kind of what makes it hard, because there's no blanket solution. We're, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging. David, but, yes? The question I would have, how much, do, how much does the data help us? and being able to identify persons that uh, repeat offenders, mm -hmm. um, 
these numbers, are we? Well, the data is a starting point. And what this data does is this data gives us sort of the, the thresholds as to where we need to have more information in order to really develop policy. But I, I mean, if we right. have 18 uh, admissions, 18,000, mm -hmm. can we say what percentage of those have, you know, were incarcerated repeatedly? Or? Will we be able to? Yes, we will. Okay. Can we right now? No, we cannot. Do we need to in order to formulate policy effectively? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So yeah, we need to have we that, what that. the numbers really mean. Right. And in the end of the day, again, We've got to know what the numbers really mean in order to design effective policy. Um, average day population, again, okay, this is the, by jail. All right. This is probably one of the better slides, this particular one. All right, we go from fiscal year 08 to fiscal year 12. And these numbers indicate what the, the categories of individuals are. And as you can see, we've got four different kinds of lines. We've got the blue line, the red line, the sort of greenish gold line, and then I think that's supposed to be purple on the other thing. But unsentence awaiting trial is the largest category. Okay? Probably that offers one of the better potentials for reduction. I will caveat that with probably, again, because you really need to know what the data says at the individual trend level, not just at ooh. I mean, the quick answer is, oh, all we've got to do is deal with pretrial and we're done. I would caution against that. Did, mm -hmm. Is it possible for an inmate to be in more than one category? Oh, is it? No, no. Not, not, not on this one. There are some other categories. Yeah. So if you're state responsible sentence, uh -huh. you wouldn't also have a local responsible sentence. Like you wouldn't get two days on a failure to appear and five years on a malicious wound. It will be counted whatever they're serving at that time, it'll be counted in that category. What percentage is that concurrent? I'm not certain about that, but I think they only counted once. But I'm not certain. It's what they're Category by the judge, by the jail is. I'm not sure if we, on that of the current charges how the jail has categorized that. But in this one here, it would be. I mean, they, coming from their reports, it's how they're being marked. Okay. Now, the, and on that, the state responsible is probably the most interesting of the categories uh, because I believe it's nine days. You have nine days to get a person out of this facility, and then they start to put something. They don't get them out though. No, no, no. I mean, that's what the rules suggest you should, and then they become a different category. They don't necessarily move. But at that point in time, I believe there may actually be some compensation from the state. And not saying that it's a driver, but there are jurisdictions where that is a revenue source. So while Use the quick answer would be, like, wow, I've got 250 people, they're state responsible. I just need to get state come and get them. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of jurisdictions that, well, well, not so fast, because that's a revenue source. And again, the hardest thing to remember is the marginal cost of one extra person in a facility. So don't discount the revenue source if it doesn't sound like a whole bunch. You know, so it is. So based on this, uh, these are actual numbers that you're counting, 200 to 600. And this is based on the average thumbs? Yeah, this is our one-to-one one to one snapshots um, for the last five years that then I did averages of that. Yeah. So in essence, you're saying around 30% of the people could be in state? Uh, probably a little less. Or yeah. I mean, they might be parole violators. Um, I mean, but what it is, it is definitely that top blue line, the unsentence awaiting trial. I mean, those are, that's just, yeah, I'm excited. Looking at it. Those, that forward. last category is hitting around 200. It looks like that would be about a, close to a third of the population could be state responsible. Uh, probably less. I would say probably more like 15, 20. Because if you added all those up, 
then that's how much that would be. Because you awaiting trial with the sentence, that's probably. David, yeah, go to the next sentence. slide. You actually start to break that down a little more. Yeah. So when it says um, on this next slide, awaiting trial with awaiting felony trial with sentence, they have been sentenced and, and are serving something, but are still waiting for a felony trial on a different charge. Yes. Okay. That's the individuals who have misdemeanor convictions, but they still got pending felony charges for example. So David, just I'm not trying to brush you. No, no, because it's trust me. I think the bottom line, and I think maybe you can come back to us again, but I think the bottom line that we want, that we were asking for today, is where are we? Yes. A, where are we in this process? And B, this is not a question for today, but a question for the next time you come to us. We put $3 million in the budget. How much of that have we spent? in terms of jail, that's the thing that... Right now, this is fiscal year 12. Um, that's the slide. I'm going to show you probably two more. Yeah, that's the last slide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so probably, as we go forward, and, you know, now that we spent it's three, Really? One to 1.2 million are grants. Right. And that's passed through. As we see, the mental health docket, um, the crisis assessment, that's the program by which when the police can have mental health come out, their behavioral health action come out, alternative sentencing, pretrial services, home electronic monitoring. If you want to know where the money has been spent, and I think more of a mix, to me, I think the better question is, which of these have not gone to scale, which gives me the greatest promise of where we can go. All right. um, mental health, I don't think we're ever going to get a full bunch more out of that. I mean, we'll get more numbers, but and that'll always be a good thing to have. But as far as, you know, and we've gotten good results from that. But if you're really talking about are we going to move 200 people with that, that's probably not going to be the place we're going to move 200 people. Probably the places where we're going to have our greatest movement are going to be your alternatives, including and right now, I don't like the term, it's what we have right now, which is home electronic monitoring. Um, that's the term we use. But that that, I don't like it for this reason. It suggests antiquated technology. I mean, we were using that, that suggests what we had 20 years ago, where you had to have a landline, and if you left, you know, your property, the line would ring someplace, somebody know you left, that's not what we have now. And it's important to note that the technology that exists today, and the management practices for what it can be used for, I think are your greatest areas of really dealing with who can be safely kept outside of the secure confinements of the jail and yet still protect public safety and the justice system if done properly. So according to this chart is the mis terminology of home and electronic margin is that hundred and fifty thousand? Is that the bar for that? No, this one is which one is it? Right, this one's... 600,000, this is electronic monitor. Yeah, this electronic monitor, this is six. Okay. And Canada, that's probably, be, we've got 40 or something. I mean, that's the small, that's the least utilized thing that we have. Which one are you talking about? The whole electronic monitor, okay. unfortunately. I mean, that's where you've got your greatest potential for change. And that's one of the reasons, as I sit here, I'm comfortable there's work to be done, but this can be done, yeah. just because that's been so unutilized. How many of you have one? How many of you have one? We got 15 capability of 100. 15 on capability of 100? Yeah. And for the 15, the cost is 600000 
Well, the staff were electronic monitors, 600,000, yes. And this is 600, the guys, can I just clarify on that? Yes. 600,000 available, or 15 people are costing us 600,000? No. Okay. It's okay. I'm just fine. Right. 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 Um, I just, it's going to stop me for just a minute. I didn't hear our answer to your question. No. What, we have not spent the 600000 No, we have not. Okay. Part of that 600000 is the contracts for the electronic monitor, and that's based on the number that you use. So what so, it might... So you're only charged the electronic for the equipment cost when you place somebody on it. So and the budget is 600 but part of the staffing is in the equipment. And I think, David, what would be helpful to us would be, and I'm just throwing this out, would be for me to come back in February with where you are in this plan. By that time, you should have some data. You should also be able to come back to us with this chart and say, as you just said, electronic monitoring, monitoring is not going to give us on the default. It's only going to be used for 10 or none. I don't care what it is. But, right. And then maybe to give us an idea of where you are in this budget, what we have worked on, what we have not worked, what we have plans for, what we don't have plans for, so we can get a better handle on where we're going down the road. And we're trying to near the end of February, because it's going to be the beginning of February. I don't know how much is going to be done between now and two months. And the only thing, the only reason right. I'm bringing that up is because I know some of this money was a grant, but it's budget time. I understand. And if you have. 3.1 million dollars, and we've only spent a million of it. Do we give you more money for next year? Do we roll this over, or do you say to us, we can't use it? I'm sure. So we need to know the budgetary implications of and, and justification for it. And no. Where are you in this plan? And I hate to push it, but I think Sorry. you know, the budget session is rolling along. We, why don't we aim for the first? OD meeting for the OD meeting in February with a back up to the first council. Is that so if I'm understanding we could utilize today is sort of more of a background. This was an excellent we background, I think, for everybody in terms of And that's the fiscal implications yeah, we get, at the next presentation. We have to get a handle on that. That one. Okay. Glad to know the present. All right. Thanks. Any comments? Cynthia? No, I, I, I'll go. Okay. All right. Okay. Next, we have uh, boards and commissions, and then we have a closed session. <laughs> Thank you.